but just because you become interested in someone, you know, it doesn't really mean that the journey has ended. It has really just begun. Now imagine that you run into a Bai Sahib or you run into a Socrates. Socrates has already been cleansed by, you know, his teacher. He has been contaminated by love, consumed by love, and on a daily basis is inspired by love, you know. And once, you know, you are touched by this thing that Socrates has, uh, you could consider it to be agape, you know, you don't really want, or you can't really care too much for your family life. You can't really care for too much for political life, for a life that contains physical power. You're all spirit and very little of meat. You know, he's a teacher filled with love and wisdom. You know, he is a true philosopher. Uh, but it's no good being a teacher, but, you know, not having a student, just um, this overflowing of water, but there is no container to receive it. Eventually, it'll just go bad. And, um, you know, Plato sees him. And let's just say Plato and Socrates were part of the same body. And Zeus cut these, you know, this, this human being. One became a Socrates, one became a Plato. Uh, Socrates realized what had happened to him. But Plato only has a very dim idea you know, he's really in the dark. And what takes place for the next few years is that there is this grinding process. Socrates knows that Plato has taken the bait. But Plato is going to struggle like any good fish. Any sensible fish is going to struggle. It's going to be filled with doubt, with fear, with anxiety, because they want kind of release from the bait. They want to go back to their life. And the picture Aristophanes gives us is that for the next few years, these two halves need to grind. Of course, in terms of Aristophanes, both halves are, have a, a lot of rough edges. That's not the case, at least in our version with Socrates. Socrates has no rough edges, but Plato does, even though they have come from the same body. But because Plato was tossed into a different area, different parents, different desires, different temperament, uh, he's not going to receive Socrates well just yet. You know, uh, he's interested, but that doesn't mean anything. So there is a good amount of back and forth, and it's going to take place for a long, long time. I mean, the best example is the book Daughter of Fire. You know, she recognizes by side. You could even say that in the first couple of pages she has fallen in love with him. And he loves her as well, you know. But loving someone, being interested in someone, they are really just these stages of infancy. They don't mean any they don't mean anything. Now the task is <clears throat> if you happen to be a young teacher, you are filled with hope and you're very ambitious. And the assumption is whoever comes your way, you can cleanse them, you can remove the rough edges, you can get rid of the baggage, the history, the past, the traumas, the various ridiculous passions that live inside all of us. Uh, if you have to happen to be a little older, you know, it's going to be much, much difficult, even if you find someone interested and interesting. There is a good chance that you will, you know, throw some crumbs out there and just wait. And just in case they show bad behavior, they kind of do things the wrong way, you'll just walk away. So when you talk about the teacher, I mean, I think it's, if you go back to Wittgenstein, or if you go back to how difficult it has been for human beings to create language in order to be able to express what they're thinking about, what they're feeling about, and what happened to them in the forest, the fright, the joy, the mystery, the enigma, because you need to kind of 
share your experiences, what you've gone through with someone. And so, even though language has always been a little vague, I think our ancestors tried the best they could to kind of give a very specific definition to words. You know, it's not like today where someone asks, so can you tell me what a woman is? And the answer is, well, the truth is, I don't really know. You know. Uh, and I think if you were to kind of just focus on your question, a lot of, I think, terrifying things come up, not because they're scary, but because they have so much depth. What does it mean to be a teacher? I don't think any of us know. Uh, you know, I don't know what makes a Tiger Woods. I don't know what makes a Muhammad Ali. I don't know what makes a certain movie star uh, so magnetic. All I know is that, you know, you watch a sports figure, you watch an actor, you watch someone on the stage giving a lecture or a talk about something about life and you find them to be just incredibly captivating and then you go home you say well I want to be like that and you try but you can't you know maybe intellectually emotionally spiritually uh, you know if for example Jesus is a LeBron James of spirituality for example and you want to mimic him well, maybe you're only 2-2. Two, two. You can't play basketball like LeBron. You know, maybe the best thing you can do is kind of just give him water once in a while. Maybe just go watch and applaud him. Uh, you know, and I think when you speak about teachers, you have to kind of <clears throat> get rid of all these ideas that teachers have infinite amount of capacity and infinite amount of compassion and they know everything about everything because every container, regardless of how profound or how profane they may be, they have a limited capacity. Uh, you know, limited capacity perhaps not so much in receiving revelations, but certainly in trying to express what they have experienced because they're, you know, first because language is profoundly limited. Then even if you were to be very articulate in expressing your experiences through language, you're dealing with the receiver, the person, who comes from a different background, they have different expectations, they make all sorts of these psychological narratives, and like many of us, they have their own baggages. And so, even if you happen to be very eloquent, even if you have, happen to have been touched by God, in fact, you're the spokesperson for God, the truth is, you're going to kind of find yourself in a cage because you keep trying to, it's kind of like parents and children, you know, how the hell can I convince my child that smoking is bad? You know, you look around, all the friends are smokers, you know, they're all losers and you're one parent with a great amount of care, compassion and responsibility and you have a kid who has no idea what care means, what responsibility is, what it means to be a parent and all this weight on your shoulder especially if you happen to be a parent who knows how crummy society is and how the negative forces really impact the human emotions and psychology. So, uh, you know, I don't know about all these osmosis stuff, the new age, you know, kind of definition and interpretation of experiences. I think Jesus had a profoundly difficult time. Uh, the Buddha had a difficult time. I mean, the Buddha never spoke about gods, never spoke about heaven or hell, none of those things. You know, 50 full, 50 like two uh, compassionate entities and 48 wrathful entities. He didn't care about those things. All he cared about was, listen, there are certain reasons as to why your life is miserable. And it has nothing to do with God. It's about the way you think. It's about the way you form attachments. It's about the way uh, you kind of just define relationships. It's, you know, your vision about things that make life so miserable, you know. Uh, and so those who come after him kind of, kind of contaminate the teachings in all sorts of different ways. So again, if osmosis, if 
passing on wisdom from a student to a teacher to a student was easy. I think a lot of great people, before Ekal Tolle and Sad Guru and all these new age, you know, fakes, uh, cannot talk about what they talk about, all these workshops that people pay tens of thousands of dollars. You know, you've been living with addiction for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, angers, trauma, all the stuff. And, you know, they promise you paradise after two weeks. Of course, it's going to cost you about 10,000 bucks, but that's the promise they offer you, you know. I think you can write about these colorful ideas in books. You can go on the stage and talk about them. You can go in the classroom and perhaps talk about them, that, you know, it's possible for these things to happen. I don't think it's true, you know. Uh, and it's probably my own limitations. I haven't read enough books and I haven't been around perhaps the right people. Uh, but I always go back to, you know, the sages that humanity has created, whether it's Socrates, whether it's Jesus, whether it's Moses, whether it's the Buddha, Lao Tzu, Confucius, Muhammad. You know, they had a disastrous time teaching and committing to people. Uh, I think it's only recently in the new age, you know, times where all of a sudden you read the Bible and you can claim to be a Christian. But all that aside, uh, how teachers are made, I have no idea. Uh, but if you, I guess, look at spirituality or the world of the inte intellect as a sport, even that arena, the spiritual arena, the intellectual arena, there are LeBron James, there are Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's, there are Muhammad Ali's of these arenas. And as you and I gravitate towards, say, Roger Federer, there is something really quite remarkable about the way he plays tennis. There is something profoundly remarkable about going somewhere, sitting, and just hearing someone speak poetically, eloquently, and they can articulate. And, you know, it's, it's in many ways the emotions that are so mysterious that live inside you through these people you can actually see your emotions it's like they breathe life into these emotions and now you can see them in flesh so you say oh that's the reason i'm angry that's how our anger comes about you know and you know at least with sports there is this humility that all of us have i am almost 60. i can play basketball like a 20 year old and age kind of, without even you being aware, creates this humility where you just go, you sit, you watch, you applaud, you enjoy. You're exhausted by just sitting and watching. Your body keeps moving, you know, it's not even in your control. And then you go home and you need to rest for like two weeks because LeBron James is worn you out, you know. You know, who doesn't want to take a picture with LeBron James? I'd like to stand next to him. I mean, look, uh, who's that politician? He's also a preacher. Um, Jesse Jackson. A few years ago, you know, he came out saying that he actually walked, marched with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And so he gave people some dates. They kind of, some people who were somewhat curious went back and kind of check the dates and they realize that it's impossible for Jesse Jackson to have been able to walk with Martin Luther King Jr. And eventually he came out saying, yeah, I fibbed. Okay. Now, I think there is a reason as to why, or say Hillary Clinton saying, yeah, we were in the helicopter and all of a sudden the enemy began to shoot at us. And then it was found that she was fibbing as well. And I think what you have in all these kind of weird stories is that um, another example is when Angela Davis you know walks the street with her companion and her dogs 
you know, I've always had this desire to have my kids, you know, just stand next to her and take a picture. And we've, we've told her, and she said, yeah, it's not a problem. Uh, not that the kids can really grasp who she is, but maybe in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, you know, they'll have enough decency to kind of read some books, to kind of think a little bit and say, ah, uh, I, I think I have a picture of this woman. Let me go see. You know, I think there is this tendency that all of us have towards anyone who has charisma and magnetism. They are celebrities. And they don't have to be a Brad Pitt. They could be a Jesus Christ. You know, as Cristiano Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo kind of gets off the bus and hundreds of people ask him for autographs. You know, everybody just wanted to be around the Buddha. Everybody wanted to be around Muhammad, around, well, for him it was a little different. He, nobody really wanted to be around him. Because <laughs> um, uh, it took a long time for him to have disciples. Uh, everybody wanted to be around Jesus, you know. And so these are like famed characters in the spiritual intellectual world. I mean, who doesn't want to like go and sit next to Socrates and have a conversation with him? You know, uh, I mean, just think, you have a friend who went to the Gurdjieffian workshop for about 20 years. Why? Because you have a guy who claims to be the soulmate of Gurdjieff, you know, and he's like a celebrity. He has Gurdjieff's components, his intellect, his emotions, his teachings, his wisdom, his insight inside him. Why wouldn't an 18 year old fly from Italy to Grass Valley to be around this person, you know? So you have this, you know, very infantile stage where the student exists, which is, I have heard someone speak, I have looked at his face, I have seen his eyes, and something about me just has come to life. I don't know what it is, but I just want to be around him. So, well, that's, you know, that's like, like an infant. You're just sitting, uh, you're no longer laying. You can kind of just sit on, on, on the ground without falling backwards. The next problem is, you know, you have a teacher who's like 70. You have a student who is 30 or 20. I mean, there is no way as, you know, a 20-year-old will never be able to understand what, you know, his or her parents have gone through to raise him. It is impossible for a 20-year-old to claim that they understand what the teacher is talking about. Now, that doesn't mean that the student will not have feelings, emotions, intuitions. You want to call those, you know, invisible kind of wisdom being shared, you can, but it doesn't lead the students anywhere except to despair and confusion, you know, and conflict because, you know, a good portion of the student is still a lot of meat. It's physical. You know, the student goes there in hopes of understanding what the teacher is saying with the same old intellect. You know, what you have is a body, a human being, who's just interested why, how, when, who, he doesn't know, she doesn't know. They're just interested. You know, there is this last line in the first, uh, the first story of the Masnavi, which is about the reed flute. Aina doni cherokamaz nist. That do you know why your mirror? is not clear uh, it's because the dust has not been removed from it you know I'm sure you can find a mirror in your garage somewhere you know that has been sitting and collecting dust for the past many 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 years imagine now you are the teacher the mirror is a student and what is it that every teacher desires? Every teacher desires to see their own reflection. That's what every teacher desires. You know, when Johnny goes in the classroom and talks about what it means to be homosexual in America, 
He wants to see minds and faces and eyes light up. You know? And then there is intimacy. For that moment there is understanding. But just because a student understands, it doesn't mean that they know what it means to live in the South. You know, they know what it means to have a very devout Christian mother. You know, they don't understand the conflict that a young man has to go through. Should I come out today? Should I come out tomorrow? Should I tell my mom this way or should I tell her that way? Should they be completely honest or should I kind of just play in the gray area? You know, the student just understands for a nanosecond and then the gate shuts, you know. Now, all students, I think, are like mirrors that have been in the garage for decades, you know. Oh, the only thing initially any good teacher can do is to remind a mirror that, yes, you have dust, and there is the possibility of removing the dust. It's just going to be very difficult. You know, uh, if you happen to be a young teacher again, you know, they'll go to Home Depot, they'll buy lots of towels, they'll buy lots of like window or glass cleaner. You know, they'll come back with a van filled with all this nonsense and the moment you spray, or the moment the, the mirror kind of sees all the stuff coming out, looks at, you know, the teacher and says, you know, I'm really thankful that you've gone to Home Depot and you've bought all the stuff. I have to go to the class right now. I'll be back. You'll be back? Yeah, I'll be back. Um, there is a gathering. I have this party to go to. I promise my friends. What party? What friends? What are you, an idiot? Uh, you know, because in some ways the student has become addicted to all the dust. They are okay with not being so reflective. You know, they're okay feeling a little heavy. You know, and they're okay with like hanging out with other mirrors that have like an inch of dust on them. Okay. But there is this, again, this very dim and vague connection that they feel towards a mirror that has some clarity. And so, you know, you kind of begin to spray the glass or the mirror and you have no idea how the student is going to react. And perhaps we should say, student-to-be is going to react. Is he going to stay? Is she going to run away? How loud is going to be their scream, you know? Um, is the teacher young enough and patient enough to go slowly section by section using towels that are made out of silk? Or is it going to be someone who's using like a wire scrubber, you know. Um, you know, I remember there were these uh, these uh, moments with Hussein. He was still a very young man, but you could kind of see the wear and tear of once in a while, you know, of working at his shop that had nothing to do with his passions, you would have customers who would talk about politics and religion. And in Hussein's estimation, you know, they were all idiots. Uh, then you would come home exhausted. And now here we are, the three or the four of us sitting, asking him questions. And uh, he kind of says a few things and one of us says something and he kind of says, oh, this is such a waste of time, you know. And all of a sudden, he kind of just comes at you like a bulldozer. He embarrasses you, not because he wants to, but he just kind of loses his patience, and rightly so, you know. <clears throat> you know, again, if you kind of liken the mirror and 
who's, you know, uh, the glass has a lot of dust on it, and the cleaner as a teacher, and the mirror as a student. Uh, first, you have no idea how the student is going to react. And you don't even know why the student is there. You know, it is rare. I mean, one of the best books that talks about this is, uh, I mean, sure, Daughter of Fire has some nice kind of pointers to this. But there's a book called, I think it's called The Hermits or Hermits. Uh, it's like this guy has been a monk or even the Christian Desert Fathers in Philokalia. You know, they've been living in caves for like 50 years and they've had all these beautiful experiences and they are filled with wisdom. And, they, and by wisdom, I mean, they really understand not only the physical life, they also understand maybe to some extent the spiritual life, you know. And so they kind of come out and they say, I am going to share my wisdom with the people of my ta town. And so a woman goes to the sage, it's like going to Jesus Christ, and Jesus kind of says, yes, they're here because they want to know about God, or truth, or wisdom, or the spiritual path. And the woman says, Master, yes, my husband and I had a fight. How can I resolve conflicts with my husband? And what can the poor guy say? He's going to look at you, the young Jesus. He's going to say, oh, forgive him, turn the other cheek. The Jesus who's not so patient will say, whatever you store down here will be stolen by thieves. You will gain the acceptance of your husband, but your husband is an idiot, which means an idiot has accepted you. And in being accepted by an idiot, you reject being accepted by wisdom, by truth, by honesty. You know? So the young Jesus gives the woman hope. The older Jesus, the more wise and impatient, who is much more aware about his capacity, about his time, about his energy, about his youth, kind of looks at this woman and says, listen, I went to the, you know, I, I left my parents at the age of 12. Do you know what that means? I went into the desert for 18 years. Do you know what the hell that means? I came back to tell you how to live life, all of life, not with your ridiculous husband. Your marriage is stupid, you know? And you're here asking me how to like resolve conflict with your mom, with your dad, with your boyfriend? Are you kidding? I'm gonna, I'm gonna waste my time with you. And that's what this book is all about. That's what, you know, Philo Kali is all about. People with a good amount of wisdom being approached by ridiculous people with infantile questions. Now, from far away, you and I see these people, you know, traveling to see a sage. And we say, this is a student with a good amount of devotion. But you have no idea once the student gets there, what the intentions are, why they are there. You know, especially in the, you know, year 2022, it's fashionable to think, you know, spiritually, to talk spiritually, to have, you know, it's like when, I, on, when I'm on these hiring committees, especially when it comes to hiring deans, you know, I don't know where, what these people do. They have all these buzzwords and they know when to use it and how to use it. You know, those have been kind of seasoned. And, you know, it's like a 45 to an hour interview and they use all the right language. And that's what all of us are. You know, you kind of go to YouTube and it's a cooking show. And someone says, well, carrots, they do something to your consciousness, <laughs> you know. And you say, well, is this a cooking show or is this like, a cooking show towards the spiritual life. <laughs> See, well, it's both, you know. Uh,
you know, and if you consider that all mirrors, all human beings, you know, we are profoundly attached to the dust that we have been collecting over the past many, many years, you know. Uh, first, because that's just the sort of creatures we are, you know. Second, because, you know, for 20 years you've been angry at your father, at your boyfriend, at your ex, at your kids. If you get rid of the anger, what the hell are you going to do? You know, all the books you read is about anger. All the friends you have, you guys talk about anger. All the workshops you go to, about anger. You go jogging because of anger. Everything you do is about goddamn anger. And now you say, I want to get a workshop. Go to a workshop that says, you will no longer be angry after a month. Okay, so good for you. Now you're not angry. What are you going to do with all the contact people on your cell phone? What are you going to do with all these books? You know? Uh, you know, I have a very, very nice young male student in my class. And today, every time he comes to class almost, he says, I'm two weeks sober. I'm a month sober. I'm five months sober. And it's great. You know, it's like you go to a workshop, you know, and you say, they, they say, well, you know, if you do A, B, C, D, you won't be as angry and then you kind of go home and you look at your boyfriend and you say I am two weeks sober I haven't gotten angry you know I am five weeks sober I haven't gotten angry and the, the truth is eventually you're going to be angry the only way you can get rid of anger is by I think the antidote really is just wisdom and I don't know what that is You know, you're well aware of the fourth way school and <clears throat> its boss, Gurdjieff. He wasn't able to leave his wealth to anyone. You know, I don't know if the story is true or not, but when he was dying, he kind of looked at his people and he said, I'm dying and I'm leaving you all this mess. Go figure it out. You know. And I think all those things are there to kind of demonstrate to us how difficult a time teachers have, how enormously a difficult thing it is to be a student. Because, you know, in as much as I say all these nasty things about students, you know, it's really, really difficult. Because intuitively, you gravitate towards Jesus Christ, towards a Gurdjieff, you know. But, you know, physical life is demanding. You know, you may want to go into the classroom and be a Socrates, but you don't want to lose your job. You don't want to go to your dean and say, well, what makes you a dean? Just because you know a few buzzwords that makes you a dean? Do you really think this is called education? You know, you can take things to, to some extent far, you know, but there comes a point where you say rent, family. You know, and it's kind of like um, if you've seen The Third Godfather where Al Pacino is in the kitchen and he says, every time I want to leave the mob life, they pull me back. And then he has a heart attack or a stroke, you know. And it's true. I think every time you run into a teacher, you read a good book and you're inspired, you watch a clip on YouTube and you're inspired, you watch a movie, you're inspired, and you want to kind of drastically change your life, don't underestimate your past, don't underestimate your habits, your addictions, and really just the demands and the responsibilities of the physical life. They're just way, way, way too much. And there's a reason, I think, why, especially in the Sufi tradition, uh, in Hindu tradition, why love plays such an important role. Because it's the only thing that has the power to burn away habits, 
burn away your passion for physical life. And you know, it's, we have all experienced it when you fall in love with someone. You want to sleep, but you can't. You want to eat, but you can't. You know, um, you know, I had this friend. She was a very, very attractive young woman. Uh, I think she now practices medicine somewhere in California. She fell in love, and she had really a great physique. And because after a certain point, he just didn't want to be around her, didn't return her calls or her texts or her emails, and changed his number altogether. She, I think, lost about 60 pounds. She was only like, I don't know, 130, 140, you know. When you lose 60 pounds, there is nothing really left to you. And she could never recover from it, you know. And that is what love does. And that's what, I think that's the only really component that can get rid of uh, you know, your desire to walk back into a safe environment. It won't, it won't let you, you know. You become like this fourth moth where you want to say, I want to be consumed by fire. I'm going to wait here day after day after day until he calls or she calls. You know, it's the only component that will help you kind of just submit and surrender yourself to supposedly a teacher that has a scrubber will constantly, and it's not like dust, you know, it's like oil and asphalt stuck to you. I mean, that's what memories do. You know, imagine you fell in love at the age of 18, things didn't work out, you're now 35, and every time you want to fall in love with someone, well, fear overcomes you and you kind of take two steps forward and 20 back, you know. That's not dust. That's like concrete.